Welcome to Come to the Table. We're excited to have you all with us again. We're your hosts, Stephanie Frankie and Tabitha Kent. And we're very excited to have with us a very special guest with us tonight, Katarina Grizzard. Katarina, can you wave to us? Hello. <laughs> it's good to see you. Thank you for joining us tonight. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, for those of you that would like to participate in um, joining the conversation with us tonight, I would welcome you to use the Zoom chat box. You can find that by hovering near the bottom of your screen. If you are on a computer, if you hover with your mouse near the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little icon come up that says chat. Just hit that box and you have a screen come up that you can type in. If you are on a phone, towards the bottom of the screen where your picture is or whoever's talking where that is, you'll see like three dots. And if you hit that, it will give you an option to hit chat and you can do that and it'll take you to a chat box where you can type in, hit enter. And then when you're finished typing, it will take you back to the main screen and you'll be able to see that. But that's the best way for us to see and participate with you during the session is if you use that box. Um, we also want to invite you to communicate with us um, even when we're not doing a live show, and you can do that through email at come to the table at ccflindale.org. Recordings for these shows are also available on CCF's YouTube channel. So those of you that are watching live, you can go there to rewatch or to send a link to your friends if you want them um, to see it at a later date and time. It's all being recorded, and so they'll be able to see it there later. I just want to give an update which I thought about. <laughs> Sorry, we're having a whole bunch of things cross our screen at the time. So yeah, we are live. <laughs> it's a little bit distracting. Anyway, um, we had a show on Easter week. Mm -hmm. And during that, we gave some opportunities for all of those who are watching to participate in some ways to serve our community um, for Easter as a way of celebrating Jesus death and resurrection and the life that he offers. And so we just wanted to give a couple updates to that and what we were able to do. And so Tabitha's going to share the first one. Yeah, one of the, um, the things that we did was invite people to be a part of making Easter baskets for a nursing home here in Lindale. Um, there are 35 residents there and we had contacted um, some of the leadership there to see what we could do to just bring some encouragement to brighten their day. We know that, um, as most of you know, the nursing homes are quite locked down and um, most of the residents cannot even leave their rooms. And so not only are they not able to be visited by any family members if they have any, um, but they can't leave the rooms. And so that was just really heartbreaking for us and we wanted to figure out a way to just bring some encouragement. And so she said, yes, anything you want to do, just you could drop it off. And um, we, we would love that. They would love that. It would be awesome. And so we did that. We had some people that helped make cookies and um, bring flowers and um, just various items. And we made a basket for each person, for each resident in the facility. And we dropped it off um, on the Saturday before Easter. And the nurses and the medical staff there were just so excited. They were like, oh, they're gonna love this and they're gonna be so happy about this. And um, that woman there that helped me set it up, she wrote me later and she said, some of these people have no one and this is really gonna be a blessing for them. And so it's just one thing. Um, we can continue to do this stuff. It doesn't have to just be um, for Easter, but we just, um, yeah, wanted to be a part of being intentional about serving and being a blessing to others. So we just wanted you to know that that happened. We have a couple pictures here. <laughs> I'll figure it out um, if I can get it to work. But we had, um, oh, it's, that's the inside of the basket. They all had a little stuffed animal because we were told that that's one thing that a lot of the people like, just something soft. There was homemade cards in each one, um, some paper flowers. Um, I'm trying to get the light to not glare here. Um, and individual baskets of or boxes of tissue and soft socks and um, some homemade cookies and some Easter candy and things that had been suggested to us that they might enjoy. And so we did it and it was really, really great. And hopefully we'll be able to do something like that again. So, yeah. 
The other opportunity that we had offered was um, to give gift cards to families through the Building Blocks program to moms and children who are in need. Um, yeah, Amy Kroll, are you with us? She was going to give an update for Building Blocks. But she does a childbirth class just before this, and so I, she wasn't exactly sure if she was going to be able to make it in time. Amy, are you with us? She isn't here. Okay. Okay, she wasn't able to make it. Anyway, we were able to get 10 um, cards with messages, personal messages, to 10 different families. And um, the two mentors that work with those women just sent thank yous and just said, our families are so incredibly blessed that some mm -hmm. of them, they've lost their jobs, they've had to try to find new things, and that they were desperate for things like diapers and formula and food for their kids. And so the gifts that we were able to give to them um, were just a tremendous blessing at this time of need, and we were able to help 10 different families. So we just want to give that update and thank everyone who yes, thank you. was a part of that. And um, thank you for participating in that. And just a reminder too, like, like I said, it just, it doesn't have to end. Like there are continued opportunities to bless people, to reach out, even with the restrictions. And I know things are loosening now, but we can't forget, like, it doesn't have to be just a, an, a holiday event or whatever. There are ways and people, uh, that have great needs around us and um, just to kind of get out of our get out of our own little world sometimes and reach out and um, ask the Lord how we can bless other people so keep doing it it's awesome we like to, to start um, at the beginning of each session uh, with a prayer of Thanksgiving and Elisa Stoner is with us tonight and she is going to um, offer our prayer of Thanksgiving this evening Elisa? All right. All right, let's pray. And as I pray, I uh, just encourage everyone to be think thinking of the things that you are individually, personally thankful for. So that's how I'm going to pray. <laughs> so, um, Lord, we thank you that your eye is attentive on us, that you are watchful, that you never sleep or slumber, that you care for us in so many myriad of ways, Lord, every day. And I pray. Lord, that you'd open up our eyes to see that. And Lord, I thank you today for the weather. Thank you for the beautiful day. Thank you for protect, protection from all the storms that have happened. Lord, thank you for our health. Thank you for giving us time with our families. Right now, Lord, thank you for um, the growth that's happening, Lord, in this time. I also thank you for that we can gather together through te technology and still see our friends and still be a community of your body, Lord, listening and encouraging and praying for one another. I pray tonight, Lord, that you would bless this time. We thank you that we're all gathered here. And again, God, for your faithful love, I pray that whoever shares tonight would speak from you and that your peace and encouragement would um, just be in this place right now, Lord, touching us where we need you to meet us. And thank you for being our guide, for giving us wisdom, for providing for all of our needs, and for being such a secure refuge for us, Lord. We thank you for all that you are and all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank, thank you. you so much, Elisa. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, so I get to share my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> the food part. <laughs> okay. Maybe it isn't my favorite, but most of the time it's my favorite. But um, I just wanted to share another really easy recipe that um, most anybody would have the ingredients for right now. Um, we have a display of it that we'll take, I'll at least partake of during our show. but. Um, the chocolate part is a pudding. Um, I think that uh, Monty's going to put the recipe up in the chat, but just I'll just go through it really quick because it's just a couple ingredients. But basically, um, it's mashed bananas and mashed avocado, and uh, the amount of there two cups of mashed really ripe bananas, and about three ripe avocados, and a little bit of vanilla if you want. 
Um, and you just blend it up in a food processor or in a blender. And if you like it to be more sweet, you can add a little maple syrup or honey to it. Um, and the cocoa, uh, one fourth to a third cup cocoa, depending on how dark you like it. And you just blend it up and it's smooth and creamy. And I just did ours into a parfait with some fresh blueberries tonight because it looks really pretty and it's really yummy. I did have an appetizer of it earlier <laughs> just <laughs> to make sure that it was good. Um, and yeah, it's just something great that again, it's because it's bananas and avocado, it's really super healthy. You can eat it for breakfast and feel like, you know, that it's a treat. Again, my kids really love it or put it in something fancy and call it dessert and still everybody enjoys it and, uh, gets a healthy kick of omega threes, right? From avocado, from avocados. <laughs> potassium from the bananas. And even antioxidants from the cocoa, especially if you use raw cacao. So um, anyway, it's delicious and uh, try it out. Let us know how you like it. Marguerite wants to know if it was your dinner. Um, it part was of it. part of it because <laughs> of the appetizer that I had of it earlier. And then I also have almond crackers and cashew queso. queso. It's like a cheese sauce made with cashews because I don't eat dairy. So I had a weird combination of food tonight. <laughs> if you would like us to email you the recipe, um, you can type your email address into the chat box and we will send that to you. You could also send a request to the email address, come to the table at ccflindale.org. And, um, okay. So we are wanting to, um, and we already introduced Katerine, but I just want to welcome her again to our show. And I'm really, really excited to see her again. She's a wonderful, wonderful person, wonderful mom, and just so sweet. Every time I talk with her, it's a blessing. And um, she has a lot of wisdom and, um, and she's very down to earth. And I just love, love that about her. And um, before we started, she was showing us little little notes that her husband left for her in the background <laughs> behind her. And it's just, it's just so great. They have such a great family and they're a blessing to a lot of people. So Katarina, once again, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming. And we're excited to um, just hear Thank more. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thank you so much for, for coming and being with us, Katarina. You're Why welcome. don't you tell us about your family and how they're involved with Mercy Ships? Yes. Okay, um, since I don't know if everybody on the Zoom knows me personally, maybe I thought I introduced myself a little bit. Sure. So I, I am personally from Germany, and I started working with Mercy Ships actually before I met Kelly. I met Kelly with Mercy Ships on an outreach while we were in Belize in 2003. Not a bad place, actually, to meet someone. <laughs> uh, pretty, pretty nice. Uh, but I was working as a nurse with Mercy Ships for just about two and a half years before I met Kelly. And um, we met in 2003, started dating. And then Kelly, he is from Mississippi. So he's an, a good Southern boy, good manners, and just uh, honest, sweet guy, those of you who know him. Um, and we got married in Germany in 2004. So, which makes it 16 years this December, which wow. seems just like a plur. I don't know how that seems to you guys, but this is still unreal to me that I've been married for three years, uh, 16 years. And I, we have three daughters. We have Miriam, who's 14. We have Betty Lou, who is 10. And then we have Lila, who is seven. Full of life, sweet girls. Mm -hmm. um, and I am getting to know a different side of them right now while we are homeschooling. So <laughs> I don't think I need to go into detail. You can probably all relate. Um, but right now, uh, I personally don't have a position with Mercy Ships. Kelly works with um, their onboarding team, which is basically the team that is considered staff development. And he does, um, when he is at work <laughs> under normal circumstances, he works with the schools. So right now they were actually supposed to have an onboarding school, which is all the participants that come and that want to go and be on the ship. And while well, some of them work here at our office in, in Lindale, probably you all know the Mercy Ship base right next to the church. And so he teaches with them and he also goes on outreaches 
So he has taken a team to Senegal in uh, November last year. And so mainly like basically full-time employed per se is only Kelly, even though we are still only some, there's only maybe a handful of people with Mercy Ships that are still, still self-supported. That is why we are very grateful to CCF that we are part of their, one of their uh, supported missionaries. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the, on my side, what happened was when the girl, when my youngest Lila went to school or started school, um, I was kind of volunteering with Mercy Ships, um, looking a little bit after the families that would come from the ship and help them uh, reintegrate into American life, which sometimes that can be a challenge when yeah. you look uh, overseas. You probably know how that feels, yeah. Tabitha. And then I started helping uh, Sharon Cox start up the ministry we have here in Venn, which is called Unending Possibilities. And uh, some of you might have noticed the Coxes, they have uh, Brianna who is in a, in a wheelchair. She is nonverbal and she had outgrown the school system here in Venn. And then when they're 21, there's pretty much nothing for them here in this area. She could have maybe taken her to Tyler, but she realized driving 45 minutes, just one way to drop her off and, and she was part of a prayer group that I had on Fridays. And we just prayed with her and we supported her. And uh, she felt like the Lord was asking her to open something up here and then. And so we opened up, up. <laughs> so up stands for unending possibilities, which is a verse that Sharon really felt the Lord was giving her from Psalms. I think it's 121, maybe I lift my eyes up to the mountain. Where does my help come from? And uh, so that is why we call it Unending Possibilities. We call our, our uh, young adults with special needs upsters to make it easy. That's awesome, I love <laughs> and, that. And uh, so we have only three. We have uh, my, my friend Sharon's daughter, uh, Priyana, and we have our founder, Donna Dion Stevens' son, JP. He is also nonverbal and he's 42. And then we have one other young man. He is originally from Mexico. He lives here in Van. His name is Eliezer and he is a sweetheart and he is going the circle with this quarantine. He is so bored at home <laughs> because we would at, at uh, up, we would make fudge and he has something to do for at least uh, from Monday. We open Monday through Wednesday for now. Once we have more participants, we hope to maybe go to four days a week, but uh, he is, he is going a little bit crazy. But yeah, that is a little bit the background story. So I have for the longest really been a stay-at-home mom um, and Kelly was out on the, well, I don't know, on the having the real position work mercy ships, which, you know, sometimes that, that was a challenge for me to accept that. Like Pastor David would always say when he would come to our mom's meetings, I know some of you want to be out in missions and guess what? Your children are your mission field. So I had to grow in that position that it is okay that I am just a mom at home. Yes, <laughs> but in our heart, we have always wanted to be in full-time mission and we came full-time back with Mercy Ships in 2008. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all that. It was yeah. great to do that. You're and welcome. I, I love what you're doing with Sharon. Um, it, I've seen a little bit on Facebook about that, but just having a kid with special needs myself, like it's so exciting and encouraging to me that there are people out there that are seeing the gap in what's available and providing something like that. It's just really And the funny thing, Tabitha, is that, well, I don't know if it's funny. I think sometimes when God calls you out of your comfort zone and you don't really know what you get into, but you just want to be obedient, that's what I felt like. And I, I would say to Sharon, look, Sharon, I'm a nurse. I, I, I know how to take care of sick people. I have never worked with handicapped people. <laughs> I, I felt that the Lord wanted me to be there for her and to yeah. just open it up because she really needed just emotional support. And, mm -hmm. and I and a friend of mine from Holland, uh, Leah, we have been her first two staff ever since we opened. We actually just had our first year anniversary in, in oh, March 18, and we were planning to go and have lunch and that was the week everything got shut down and our poor Eliezer he already saw himself sitting in tellies in 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 van having his Mexican lunch and everything was was blown out but yeah it's it's a I have come 
and my friend Linda, who's with us on here, I've told her that too. But I have come to love these special needs people. I feel like when you're around them, there is a, a certain presence of the Lord that, that comes with them that, that you lose in the busyness of our yes. life. Yes. And, uh, and I think there's something so special about them yeah. that I just, I really miss them. I really yeah, do. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's really awesome. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Katarina, could you share with us some of your highlights throughout this past year? Yeah. I mean, you've already shared those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see. So since you sent me the questions, did you want to, did you want me to just touch real quick what we do with CCF as well? You had a... Yeah, oh, sure. You just want to yeah. do it really quickly. So we do the Helping Hands. I don't know if some of you might have heard. It's a ministry that Kelly and I felt like we could, you know, help the church with for, for single ladies or widows if they have something that needs to be done around the house or they have an issue with their car. We thought maybe we should have something like that in place. So that's what Kelly is mainly over, but we, we started that up a few years ago. And then we helped Miss Sue in Kitzone. Um, I have in the past helped with the ladies Bible study, which I really, really miss um, due to the work that I do now with Sharon. Uh, and also we do, we lead a life group. So we have just started now for two weeks. We do Zoom meetings as well, but, but I am being an extrovert. I really miss the physical, you know, Yes. so I'm trying to learn the, <laughs> to live with this quarantine. And then the personal highlights. Yeah. Last summer, we were able to go and see my family in Germany uh, with my whole family, which was absolutely wonderful. We were not able to do that for the last six years. So the kids oh, um, time. have basically, yeah, just like six years is a long time. And we just, I mean, the Lord blessed us in so many ways. Uh, our girls, they're just really troopers, you know, like, I, you are sometimes as a mom a little critical and you hope that you know they will adjust and and considering the seven hour time change and the different language and I mean they were such troopers and and we just really had a plus we went for five weeks which was really amazing Kelly was able to get off that much with mercy ships he worked some from uh, basically a, a home office in Germany because often now all you have to have is a is an internet right and a laptop but we were able to connect with a lot of friends and family and supporters. That was really, really a highlight. And then also when Kelly went to Senegal in November, I personally always feel a little anxious when he's not around, um, just because I feel safer, you know, when the man is in the house. And, and I was a little worried about him gone. And, and the Lord has just... Um, so it, protected us and has just blessed us while he was gone in a way. I mean, that the girls were doing pride in the morning. I didn't have a hard time getting them ready for school. And I just, I just realized God does look after his people, you know, and there's really no need to be anxious. And uh, with him, obviously, this is part of his job traveling. Uh, it's nice to know that, uh, that, you know, God looks after us and the girls are being a little bit older now helps, of course, as well, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also one other, I mean, just really a praise is just how God has provided for our needs. Um, you know, we, I mean, when you're in the mission field, often you, you, you have months that are lean and then you have months that are plenty and uh, to just even it out. I mean, it's just been wonderful to, to really see God's hand of provision and, and, and just trusting, you know, just remembering, okay, where, where does our, hope and our provision comes from and mm -hmm. so that was a new that just this last year even being able to pay for the trip you know to Germany uh, to fly five people over there you know and then gas and and rental cars and everything is is just a little more so that yeah. was really really a neat thing last year that's great awesome. yeah looking ahead into the next couple of years what are some of your hopes and dreams for yourself or for your ministry hmm yeah that was a little bit of I have to think of that a little bit longer. Well, uh, work-wise, ministry-wise, I now see my work with, with Sharon as my ministry. And uh, the, the hope and the, the prayer for that would just that we would get more upstairs. Like I said, we only have three right now. Um, we really could use, we have, we have capacity for eight, and it would really be awesome if we could get at least another five or so. 
just because then you can get into a better routine. And also right now we only have one that's really verbal, which he makes up for the other two, but still <laughs> it would be nice to, to have some more, you know, in the future. And the other thing was that um, the, we had planned a trip with the girls to Disney World this summer. And um, I, personally, I know it's not a very spiritual <laughs> hope or desire, but I just personally would, we would love to take the girls and, and just take them to Disney World because they are at such a great age. And, uh, you know, with everything being shut down, we are all in this waiting period. Yeah. And uh, so I told the girls, look, all we can do is, is trust and wait and pray. And you know what? If it opens up, then good. And if not, then we'll just wait. And that, that is like on a, yeah, on a personal note with Kelly, I think just, I just hope that the Lord will continue. And I know he does to look after us while he's, while he's traveling, when he goes back with his job, which is fine. And, and the other thing that, I think is, is spiritually more on my heart than, than just the, the, the physical is um, I've always, maybe because I'm not from America, even though I'm an American now, Tabitha, I don't know if you knew that I have become an American citizen. Yes. <laughs> In November. I'm very proud of it. That's awesome. um, I know. Uh, but I, because I can keep both now, I didn't have to give up my German one. I've always been very interested in international politics, you know? And so I, I watched, international news all the time and um, I personally have very much a sense for for justice and I've just yesterday found out and Ellie Lou we talked about a little in our in our life group meeting last night and I don't know if any of you had heard that but for example that the, the leader of North Korea is in very bad health actually some media outlets say he might even be brain dead after he had undergone a surgery and I remember praying for just for God's justice and righteousness to come forth. And, and I usually don't, I don't wish death on people, but I am just tired of seeing these poor people in North Korea suffer under a leader like that. Mm -hmm. And for me, I just, I, I have the sense that we have entered a season where maybe we will start seeing God's justice come. And that makes me so excited. Because I know God is a God of love and everyone wants him to be a God of love. But when I read my Psalms, he is a God of righteousness and of justice. And so I just think it's so cool that we can pray and we can ask the Lord to help us stand up and speak up for those that can't speak up for them. Like if I think of our brothers and sisters that have lived in North Korea all their life, all they know is labor camps and prison. And I'm so tired of these tyrants. So I don't know. I'm just saying, well, Lord, if you already, why don't you just continue with Maduro and Venezuela and, and Assad and Syria? Why, why we just don't keep going? <laughs> Sorry, but I just like, I like, I like seeing justice and I like, watching what the Lord is doing in this earth and, and quite frankly, becoming a homeschooling mom, which has really stretched me. Uh, I realize this is a time where we can all look and see like the scripture that says what can be shaken will be shaken and what cannot be shaken will remain. And I feel like we at this, mm. at this cusp of something great because the Lord is bringing us back to these first churches right that they had an act where they met in their homes and i just feel like this is such a great opportunity i i we've had some of the greatest devotional times with our girls and i just am excited to see what the lord is doing i really am so Amen. sorry that was probably a little too long <laughs> <laughs> can you just give us some ways that we would be able to pray for you specifically uh-huh yes uh I think patience right now <laughs> with my children <laughs> is probably number one. Um, I mean, like I, I look at Elisa, like you are saying, I mean, I know you probably homeschool too, right, Stephanie? And yes. then Tabitha, you all, okay, so you are all saints. And, and like I said, I, I, you give me a room full of sick people and I, I make them all better for you. But the whole schooling part is something that I, I've not had training in. I still don't know how to pull the pen over and leave the one there. I mean, I am just, Lord, you need to help me. 
So I think that, I think the Lord, I have a teenager who can help me with the younger girls, some of their math. But yeah, it, I have to honestly say this has stretched me and I probably have gone through a few more wine bottles than under normal circumstances. <laughs> so I hope we can all be honest. I, I, I feel like some of you can probably relate, but you know, I mean, it's just, it's what it is, right? I mean, we want it. I think it by the end of the day, I'm just happy if everybody survives in my household. Also because with the hubby at home, I don't know how it's in your house, but the traffic around my fridge, I'm like, people, I just went shopping. It, just because you're home does not mean you need to have a snack every 30 minutes, right? Um, so that is, that is like when you're that close together, I'm like, okay, Lord, I don't know if it's just patience or just the will not to kill anybody is probably even also a prior request. And, and just, okay. so whatever the Lord wants to bring out, I'm, I'm up for it. And then like, I don't know if that is not a spiritual prayer, but if y'all want to, I, I would love to take the girls to, to, to Disney World. I just don't, I want to just dare to ask him that. So there we go. Well, we have invited our, um, our good friend, Christy, uh, to pray for you actually right now. And I oh. know that some of the things you're asking prayer for, she can definitely relate to. So I know that she will really have a heartfelt prayer for you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank I, you, Christy. Christy, can you go. go ahead and pray for Katerina? Yes, I would love to. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. God, I thank you so much for Katarina, and I love her expression of just life. And God, I thank you for the joy that you place on her. God, in the midst of these circumstances that stretch us, God, I thank you that you are with her. God, that you give her wisdom in every situation, God. Um, yes, just give her wisdom in every situation. And God, we just ask for your favor. We thank you for killing this virus so that they can go on their trip to Disney World, God. God, I thank you for your provision for the food that keeps disappearing. <laughs> and I just ask, Father, that you would rest upon her, rest upon her home. I thank you for her speaking into the lives of people, the home group that they have. I thank you for favor for her husband, uh, protection. God, you're just a good, good God. And you give us everything we need, God. So we just trust you. I thank you that they're walking in obedience to you, that, <clears throat> that she's obeying you even when it's difficult and it's something new and it's something she doesn't know anything about. And you show up, God, and you give her everything that she needs. And this ministry that she's stepping into, God, I just thank you for favor. I thank you for more children that need to know your love and can show the teacher's love to a new aspect of who you are and your character, God. Thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Christy. You're welcome. Thank you, Katarina. We welcome. will come back to you in a little bit. Okay. Well, I want to start this next session by sharing with you um, a story about myself. <laughs> um, it happened maybe a year and a half or two years ago, and our family was playing a board game, and one of my kid's friends was also over. And it got to the point that it was late, and I was really tired. So... Um, we decided that we're going to stop it this time. We'll count up everybody's money and see who won. So my last turn finished. So I started like figuring out all of my assets, my land or whatever, and had a calculator trying to figure out how much money I had. And, um, so started with, you know, cause I had different things to calculate. So I would punch the numbers into the computer and I would get to the end and I'm talking like I have thousands, thousands of money to calculate, but I finished and it said like 312 or something like that. And I was like, okay, something is not right. So I hit clear and I started all over again 
calculating my land, calculating how much I had of this, how much I had of that, putting it into the calculator. And I finish again, and it still says like 300 and something. And it was the same number that I got before, but it was somewhere around 300 and some. And I just sat there staring at the calculator being like, that's some really tricky math. And I could not figure out. And so my husband hears me say that that's some really tricky math. And he burst out laughing at me <laughs> because he had watched me do it the whole time. So he knows that I'm supposed to end up with something like 200 and something thousand, but I'm ending up with 300 or whatever. So what I had done is every time I was putting a number into the calculator, like say it was 12,000, I was hitting 12 and forgetting to add the zeros. So by the time it comes to the end where I'm supposed to have thousands of dollars, I end up with only hundreds. And so now we laugh that when it gets later at night, we usually pass nine. <laughs> <laughs> so we better finish real quick. <laughs> That's my tricky math time. And so they know anytime we're doing something and I'm getting tired to like, oh, it's tricky math time for mom. So just this last week, my heart has been stirred by um, just things that are happening just in our family, but also around the world in different situations and just feeling this sense of injustice and things that are unfair and really being troubled in my heart about that. My personality is very black and white and I just have a strong sense of like truth and justice and I want things to be right and fair. And when they aren't, my heart is just not settled. And so these things have been stirring in my heart. Well, then I remembered um, the story about the landowner who has a vineyard in the Bible. It's the story that Jesus tells and how this landowner who has a vineyard invites people to come and work for him for the day for an agreed am amount of money. And, and he comes back later in the day and offers, some people come and decide that, yeah, they'll work for that much. And then some other people could come later in the day and that, yeah, we'll work for the rest of the day for that amount of money. And then he offers it again at, towards the end of the day to some more people. And they're like, yeah, we'll come. And then at the end of the day, those who came all day, those who came half day, and those who came just for the last part of the day receive the same amount of money. For people like me, it's a really hard story for me to take. But then I remembered the story of the loaves and the fish, where there's five loaves and two fish, and Jesus takes it and gives thanks. And it makes enough food to feed 5,000 men plus women and children. And so I just started thinking, okay, God does a tricky kind of math. <laughs> Too. And that um, just like I was putting numbers into my calculator and forgetting the zeros that sometimes we look at our circumstances, mm -hmm. our situations, and we don't see all of the zeros that God is doing. And we feel a sense of injustice or things that aren't fair, or that when we see five loaves and two fish, how does that make food enough for 5,000 people? And um, it's just sometimes the kingdom of God works on principles that seen backwards or upside down or not fair or absolutely miraculous. And um, as I was standing there washing dishes and thinking about these stories and pondering the things in my heart, there were more scriptures that came to mind that seem backwards or upside down or missing a few zeros with some little tricky math, things like the last shall be first or the greatest among you will be the servant of all. Um, whoever loses their life will find it. You see, it's not the way that we look at the world and think is fair. How do you find your life after you've lost it? But it's the way that God has designed the, princi the principles. Um, and even to think about healing, you know, we so want to see healing or things to be righted, especially when you see so much hurting, you know, and so, but then when you look at scripture and you try to study healing, it's like, okay, in this situation, God asked them to dunk in a dirty river. In this situation, he asked the prophet to lay on him and then breathe life into him. In this situation, he took 
mud and put it in the eyes. In this situation, he healed the woman who touched his cloak. Or one time, they weren't even there. He just spoke the words and he healed someone who was far away. There's no equation. There's no formula that gives us a specific answer or the same answer every time that depending on the situation and circumstance, it looks different. And um, I came back from Africa last summer really shaken in a way that I haven't been before. I've been to a lot of different countries and um, done outreach to a lot of poor people. And, but for some reason, this affected me in a way that was deeper than anything I experienced. I don't know if it's because I'm older and so my understanding um, has some more depth to it, I guess. Um, but one of the couples that Patty Forney and I stayed with um, were my age and the life that they had experienced. Um, Judith had been born in Rwanda. Her family was actually killed during the genocide there and so grew up a lot living on the streets and did not have family and then um, Fred was born to um, a mother who was just one of many wives and so though his mom had nine children all together there was 27 of them and he did not have a relationship with his dad that was anything other than um, anger and beatings um, he slept on the floor in a little hut. Many times they didn't have food, but he said we had an avocado tree. So I knew that if I did not have any other food, I would probably have an avocado that day. Um, while they would sleep on the floor, dirt at nighttime, the rats would come and chew on the bottom of his feet that his feet would hurt when he would try to walk to school. And just thinking that my life was so different. I was born to parents who loved God, who I knew with all my heart loved me. Um, my mom homeschooled me. And so me and my siblings and me and my parents had a great relationship. And I was always fed. I never knew me in, in that kind of a way or wondering where my next meal was going to come from. And um, was just questioning, God, why, why am I the one to be born in a place that I didn't have to think about that? And yet here are this man and woman who truly love God and have a relationship with him. And I remember coming back one Sunday morning and the song that was being played during the worship service was just declaring, um, the goodness of God and his faithfulness. And I just started sobbing because I'm like, God, it's easy for me to say all of my life you have been faithful and all of my life you have been so, so good. But in comparison to what I've just seen in Africa, it's easy for me to say that. Like, I want Fred and I want Judith and I want those women that I met that had to be child slaves. I want them to know the goodness of God and to know that you have been faithful. And can they know that? And they can. It's just on a very different level than what I have been able or been exposed to. Um, also, yeah, I think something that's close to Tabitha and I is... Um, the struggle of adoption and having children who have special needs kids. And um, those of you who know Tabitha know that she has four adopted children. All of them have come from um, places of trauma in their early life. And they all struggle with varying degrees of challenges, challenges yeah. because of that trauma. And Honestly, like I remember before they adopted their very first child, um, her and Lewis calling us and asking my husband and I to pray about whether they should adopt this boy that they met in Thailand. And I thought, of course, I don't need to pray about this. Of course, God would want you to adopt this boy that probably will not be adopted by anyone else. Of course, he would want you to be a family for him. Why do we, why do we even need to pray? And she said, well, we need to pray because when it gets hard, we need to know that God spoke and we, that we have that to fall back on, that God is telling us, yes, this is what you need to do. And 
in my naivety at the time, just not being like, of course God would want us to be a family to this boy. And now understanding, like, it takes the word of the Lord to walk through adoption for a child who um, has been through so much trauma, who has special needs. And my thoughts at the time were that it would be a happily ever after story. And that if we love enough and show them God's love, that it would heal. And it doesn't heal everything. <laughs> I mean, God's love can. Um, but I don't not, want to say that. Yeah, and it's, it's just, it's not the two plus two equals four kind of thing. Like, I think that's the whole point. Like, we don't see everything. And the, the thing that's easy for us to understand is, well, we do this and God does this and then this happens. And that makes so much more sense and it seems so much more fair if people are treated equally or if there isn't suffering or if love is enough or whatever, but it's a struggle when it isn't. It's a struggle when you still see suffering, when people that truly give their hearts to the Lord and there's still what's, you know, injustice in our lives or there's still starvation or there's still trauma and brokenness that influence everything that they do on a daily basis. Or you see like what I've I walked through and continue to walk through with my kids that that they suffer through because of the sins of other people that just doesn't seem fair, fair or right and um but you know what we've been talking about and and I, just to be really honest we don't have an answer to any of this it's just the honesty to say it it's difficult it's really difficult but also the honesty to say we recognize also that we can only see a little bit we see through a glass dimly or whatever that verses we found earlier yeah, first corinthians 13 12 it says now we see things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror but then we will see everything with perfect clarity all that i know now is partial and incomplete but then i will know everything completely just as god now knows me completely so I think it's just the understanding that sometimes God is like my husband where he sees me trying to calculate <laughs> all of these situations in my life, but I don't see this, that the zeros are missing, but God it does. And so we think we get to the end of what our conclusion, what we think our conclusion should be and think that, well, this is some kind of tricky math, <laughs> but he has all the zeros where they need to go and has the right ending. And so it's not, yeah, some kind of equation or formula that has a predictable outcome. And so um, we just started talking about like, so then what do we do at the times when things don't add up the way that we think that they should or things seem unjust or unfair? And um, We've just been talking about that the last few days. And for me, as I felt this stirring, um, especially in the last week, she's just had situations with her kids. And um, I'm just like, God, it just feels so unfair. And um, I want my love. I want their love. I want the answers to make it better. Um, and we've been seeking the same thing. I mean, we just talked about a situation where I remember several years ago sobbing over one of her son's um, challenges and asking God, we need to have answers for this because what if this doesn't work out? And we still don't have an answer to that situation. So, um, Anyway, I've just come back to, you know what, God, you're trustworthy. You see all the zeros that we think are missing. And I want to, um, I think we all long for the stories where we can take five loaves and two fish and be able to feed the 5,000. And that happens sometimes. It does. But it's not always. Um, those aren't all the stories. Those aren't all the ways, the answers, or the sums that God gives to us. 
And so um, Tabitha had something she wanted to read, which um, is just a post written by a friend of ours who um, lost her young daughter to a seizure um, a couple of years ago. And so this was written um, on the two year anniversary of her daughter's yeah. death. I just um, a few days ago, I guess, maybe yesterday. Um, I think as, cause as we're talking about this, like it's easy to see, okay, things are not going to add up. Like we think they should, you know, sometimes it's just a struggle and how do you find hope in the middle of that? And so t for this, just a very short thing to come from our, our good friend, who's a very wise woman. And like Steph said, her daughter died tragically and suddenly, um, two years ago. And I, I'm sure she wouldn't mind sharing this because she posted it on Facebook, but I just found it yesterday and I just thought this makes so much sense. Um, she's saying, today is the second anniversary of my daughter's death. When I woke up, I read a devotional about hope, but not the ordinary hope that is based in knowing that there will be a good outcome, but godly hope that doesn't promise that things will change. Part of the explanation is, Hope has something to do with presence, not a future good outcome, but the immediate experience of being met, held in communion by something intimately at hand. I miss my daughter immensely. I have no ordinary hope that that will change, but I have a godly hope that embraces me. And it really reminded me of something, you know, that the Lord spoke really strongly to me a couple years ago and I've shared it with some of you when I was going through a really 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 difficult time and the Lord met me in like a really intimate powerful way but his words to me were I can't promise you that everything is going to be okay but will you trust me anyway and normally that would be like heck no <laughs> you know, like that's not in the little promise book right that we have on a coffee table but it was something about like this quote says like the presence that intimate immediate at hand presence of god that we're held by that gives a hope that isn't about the outcome it's not contingent on circumstances or what may or may not happen but it's about his presence and that's that's supernatural. Mm -hmm. It's a supernatural thing. And that's where we have to live in the middle of this world where the math doesn't add up a lot of the time. Our scripture that we wanted to read tonight is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And if you have your Bibles, you're welcome to pull them out and um, read along with us. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to read verses 7 through 10 and then verses 15 to 18. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving, and God will receive more and more glory. I've talked several times with different women's events, just how God works, and that it's for our good, like this says, for our benefit and for his glory. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now, rather we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Yeah, I did the last couple verses today, even um, as we were reading this earlier, were really a challenge to me as I look at my present troubles that I can see. And it's saying, 
that they're small and they won't last long and we can't fix our gaze on those things, you know, um, and that the glory ahead of us vastly outweighs it. And it's really, if I'm honest, a really big challenge to me because they don't feel small and they feel really heavy. It's hard to imagine something that outweighs that. And so it's like this invitation from the Lord to look up and to allow him to work in my heart and just be honest with him about that and say, you know, just ask him for a new perspective. And I can't see everything and I'm not going to be able to see everything, but just that willing heart to say, okay, God, what I see isn't the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And just surrendering to that. I don't see the whole picture mm -hmm. and what, who you are and what you have for us and what is eternal is, is so much greater and it, it, it's eternal. And it's not the temporal things that really are small in comparison and really do pale in comparison to the glory that awaits us. And um, yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a wrestling, mm -hmm. if I'm honest. Katerina, I would like to invite you back and just um, have you share an example with us of in your own life how it seemed like God's math didn't add up. Wow, did you? Okay, I was worried. I was really big all of a sudden. I hope I'm not. Okay. First of all, can you all move that, that chocolate pudding, please? I've been fooling for the last hour. I just feel like that's not fair. Uh, have your, yes, there you go, Tabitha. Go, have, feed that little elephant on your t-shirt. Okay. Um, so, like, yes, I thank you for your tra transparency, girls. I, I mean, I'm watching the time be a little bit over. Is that okay? Or are y'all having a time limit? I, we're okay with that as long as people want to stay, so... Yeah, because we'll they totally, you're right. <laughs> okay, so some of you know my story already. I think Luen, I have shared it one time with Moms Inc. So I know, I know some of the ladies from that were with Moms Inc. But um, I, so I grew up in East Germany, and and it was tight. Like I, I grew up in a Christian home with five children, and money was always an issue. We we didn't have a car. But I had a very happy childhood. And I'm like you, Stephanie. Um, I, I have worked in Africa as a nurse for three years before I turned Mercy Ships. And I have, I could say almost every day, ask myself, why was I not born here? So just the perspective of the way we are blessed in living in a country that we are in. But I grew up with no credit card debt. My parents raised us with the sense of, you want something, you, you save up for it, and you don't get something unless you have the money. Not rock, big rock sign, right? Sign. So I, I guess my whole life I, I, I went to, to nursing school and I made good money in Germany until the Lord called me into missions. And then I was, of course, a missionary from then on. But I didn't realize how I had prided my, how I was becoming prideful about the fact that I had no debt, okay? Like, it was very freeing. I have to say, when I was in Africa in Mozambique, all I owned was a, a big backpack with the clothes on my back, and it was one of the most freeing times in my whole life because I had nothing, I had no worries, I had no home to look after. And then when I, when I dated Kelly, um, we were engaged already, and we were about... We had already made plans to get married. Well, he had, before we, we even started dating, he had gotten into a business deal with a friend of his in down in Gulfport, Mississippi, where they opened up a little French restaurant. It was called Bon Shore, and they have prayed and fasted and sought counsel in this church about it. And they both wanted to run this restaurant and use the profits from it to support missionaries. Um, which is really, which was a very, I thought, noble cause. So then when we started dating, he took me to the restaurant. It had just opened. It was open for like three months and it was flourishing like crazy in Gulfport, Mississippi. It's the first French restaurant in that town. And it was in 2005. It opened up in 2005 in April. And then in, it was 
very close to the water. And in October, Hurricane Katrina hit and the building was destroyed. So Kelly had let me know when we were dating, he said, look, I am the financial owner per se for this restaurant. Uh, Eric, his friend, because he only had a green card, he couldn't borrow any money. His name was on all the documents. And he said, listen, if this thing doesn't work, I'm going to have to pay this loan back. And you know, when you're dating, I mean, you on cloud seven, you're like, of course, I go with you to the end of the earth. And no idea that, you know, you actually, anyway, I said, of course, no problem. So we were married, we got married in December of 2004. And then Hurricane Katrina hit in, in August. So we were just, we were literally just married for like, nine, what is that? Nine months, something like that. I was pregnant with Miriam. She was a honeymoon baby. And because we had traveled, we were wanting to travel the world and take off, you know, do a sabbatical right after we got married, like great dreams. And then when we find out, found out I was pregnant with Miriam, we were coming back to the US, but we did not have a health insurance. You know, when you're young and you, you think, well, you, you invincible, you're not going to get sick. You just have a travel insurance. So that's what we had. And we never had anything really. Well, Hurricane Katrina hit, the, the restaurant was destroyed. We were stuck with a, I think it was an $80,000 loan that Kelly had to pay off. And then Miriam, I was trying to do the whole home birth thing um, with, a, with a midwife. And I had a good, she was really good with me during my pregnancy. But when it was time to give birth, Miriam was basically tra laying transverse in my uterus, meaning her, her head was sideways. And the more I pushed, the more I wedged her into my pelvis. And I had to have an emergency C-section um, with a bill of $26,000 afterwards. So there we were, like not even married for a year, living in a town called Pascagoula in Mississippi. I don't know, maybe Luann might know. Tiny little town, excuse me, besides Walmart and Lowe's, no culture whatsoever. Literally a culture shock for me to live there. But it was the hospital where Kelly, he's a PT, where he could get work. And that was the hospital where Miriam was born. So here we were and my world just collapsed. I went from being on the mercy ships in a community with other believers where I felt like I was able to use all my giftings. I speak Spanish. I was leading Bible studies. I mean, it was heaven for me. And then here I was married, had a little baby and we had a hundred thousand dollar debt. And I remember thinking, I, this is not what I've signed up for. <laughs> and, and, um, Needless to say, we, we wanted, our desire was always to come back to missions full time. So we prayed and Kelly went to work and I stayed home with the little one. And um, we, had, we, had a, we had made several friends in the church and, and we just shared it with one of the friends one day and explained, you know, just the, the financial burden we were in. And he just simply said to us, listen, I've always felt like when you're in debt, you give yourself out of debt. And here I am thinking, yeah, really, uh, yeah, right, whatever. And I was just smiling, you know, trying to be polite. <laughs> Turns out when we got like our end of year statements from the church, you know, I guess the tax statements, and we looked at them the first year uh, when we had to start paying off, off the debt, I guess it was October 2005 to October 2006. We had never given more to the church and we didn't even realize it. I guess by tithing and, and giving to missionaries and, uh, and several other offerings, we had given more. We had started giving what's called a Passover gift. So we, we had a, a preacher come and he spoke about just the importance of the Jewish people to unlock their year of blessing. They would give a, a specific gift during Passover. And it just really touched our hearts. And we were just like, you know what, we're going to, our everything in us was like this is crazy you are in debt do not do this you know that you have the Dave Ramsey and once one ear and then you're like okay this makes humanly spoken no sense to give a large Passover gift you know and needless to say speaking of God's math we 
we, we paid off $100,000 in two and a half years, and we came back with Mercy Ships full time with no debt. Wow. And that to us was just the sign that, yes, when you honor, when you still give tight, when you still give sacrificially, the Lord honors that. And um, I think we, we live frugal. I mean, I, I would, I did the whole envelope thing. I don't know if you all, you know, the, the Dave Ramsey thing, I would get my grocery monies out in, in a little envelope and I would just stretch it. And thankfully, Miriam was so little, she didn't eat much. I just had to press feed her. So I made sure I, you know, had enough milk on the milk bar. And I, I was like, okay, Lord, I don't know what, what all of this is here, what you're trying to teach us, but we came back, when we came back with Mercy Ships full time in 2008, this has been a story that we just like sharing because, because on, on, in our economy, it made no sense. Right, right. I think in God's economy, it, it's total different. And so I agree with both of you, what you shared earlier. And, and I think it comes down to, we are all going to be stretched, you know, we, we all going to be tested. And, and what good is our faith if we never are being tested? Right. And for us, looking back now, you know, a lot of people have trouble in their first year of marriage, right? Like when you go through something tough, like what do they say? Is it the first year and the year seven? And then I don't know, after that, they say, if you make it through those, you're good to go, kind of, right? <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, that first year, <laughs> I, that whole, you know, in good and bad days, and man, there was a lot of things I think the Lord still had to work out in me, and, and even the whole thing of, of pride, I, I realized I was just so prideful about, oh, I have no debt, look at me, how smart I lived my life, and all of a sudden, it's like, well, let me teach you something, and <laughs> ever since then, this is, for us, when it comes to finances, we just, we have always enjoyed giving, I thought I was generous before I met Kelly, but Kelly is one of the most generous men I've ever known. I mean, he has, he's the type where you, you, he doesn't say it, he just does it. And, and that's, he, I've learned a lot from him. And, and I, I, I am also on, on, how can I say, I totally hear you, Stephanie, with, I have, had such good friends in Africa where I was like, okay, why are they in such poverty while we live like this? And it's hard sometimes to press just the, the unfairness of the whole thing, isn't it? And, and, and sometimes it makes me also angry. And I, I feel like I'm a lot like you that I have this righteous anger in me that I, when I see injustice is done, I'm like, I cannot believe, you know, that happens. And so I plow up because my personality is more like that. And Kelly is trying to teach me, listen, that is righteous anger. We just need to learn to channel it into prayer. And so my prayer is just for all of us to just trust the Lord that he is, he is working out his good in your children's lives. You know, he is working it out in our lives. I personally coming from East Germany though, I feel like that we have a little bit of danger in our Western society when it comes to, to giving and to sacrificially giving. I really don't think we have really a concept of that. And that is why I actually believe this whole pandemic is a blessing from the Lord because I feel like he is shaking that God of the, the idol of, of career and jobs. And, and I really like how Pastor David and Ms. Luen just talk about it on Sundays. It's like <laughs> Ms. Luen was sharing about the hair, the hair color being out. Like she watched, right, Ms. Luen watched somebody that didn't have her roots colored and that can become an idol. And I think that that's, we, we are so, we are so prosperous in this country that I think sometimes we just don't really know what it means to, first of all, be giving people, be, be sacrificial in, in giving and, and to not just always get hung up on these little things and get like angry. Like I just, I have to constantly stay off Facebook because I am so saddened by the way that people talk to each other. To me, that is just, that there's no respect. And, and often it's among Christians. And I'm like, people, the time we live in is, we shouldn't be wasting it on that kind of stuff, right? So, yeah. sorry, there was my thank story. <laughs> thank you, Katarina, for sharing us your story about the, the five wills and two fish that you gave and how God made it. <laughs>
Yes, Much that's right. That. I yeah. love the, the, just the, the words of giving your way out of debt and just learning to be a cheerful giver. And um, Lillian wrote something there about God wanting us to be like the River Jordan, free flowing, obedient to his voice when he says to give and not a dead sea, hoarding and fearful. And um, we are blessed. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, part of the upside down kingdom too, is that somehow in giving that we receive. And that's awesome. Yeah. So thanks for sharing about that. And yeah. speaking of giving, Speaking of giving, I have a book giveaway. Those of you who know me well are not surprised <laughs> that it's a book. Um, but I thought that this book went well with our theme for tonight. It's um, by a friend to my husband and I, who was a fellow YWAMer at one time. Um, his name is Jason Hegg, and the book is called Aching Joy, and it's about following God through the land of unanswered prayer. Um, he and his wife have walked through a challenging situation with a boy who um, started out healthy, but then ended up being diagnosed with autism. Severe and, autism. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's just the things that he learned about how to have the joy in the midst of suffering. And when you really look to God for answers and they are answered the way that you want them to be. And um, it's just a really great, encouraging book. And so... Um, how we're going to do this is we want to hear from you. We want to hear your thoughts, what God may have spoken to you through this episode or questions that you may be wrestling with. Send us an email at come to the table at ccflindale.org and just sharing those things. And anytime now through next Wednesday, it doesn't have to be long, just a couple sentences. Yeah, just time. very brief. And then um, all of the emails that we get, we'll draw, we'll put those names um, together and we'll draw a name and then announce the winner next week. And then I will either drop this book by or send it to you in the mail. So um, one of the things that we um, would like to do tonight um, is give um, a chance to, for us to reflect with each other and um, just to think about for our own lives and, and we want to invite you to take a few moments to be honest um, with maybe areas where, like we were talking about, just struggling with things not adding up or not being fair and um, be honest with ourselves, be honest with the Lord, knowing that he can handle, you know, the struggle and, and then taking some time to hear from him about that. Um, and um, or maybe it's a, like Katarina's story where you've experienced the what doesn't seem fair, but really is a huge in, in God's upside down way of blessing us um, that you could share with someone else. And so for those that might watch this um, later on that aren't watching, won't watch this live, but watch it later on. Um, we want to encourage you um, to take some time to call a friend or message a friend or a couple people or journal or someone in your family and just take some time to to write it out to talk it out and to discuss this a little bit read those verses together um and give space for the lord to speak to you about it to um like we were the quote about hope like it's it's the presence right the hope isn't just about what's happening but it's about the presence of the lord and him meeting us in an intimate way and um Sometimes we don't receive that or we don't experience it because we don't have space for it. And so and we don't make space for it. So I just want to invite you to do that, um, to take some time and, and make space for that in your life and ask the Lord, invite him um, to meet you in that place of honesty and let him speak to you in it. And um, we're also going to give an opportunity for those of you that are still with us right now um to go ahead and do that with each other and she's going to explain how we're going to do that yeah so we're going to try something new um in this and we are going to break up into small groups zoom has a tool that we can use called breakout rooms and so we're going to try that tonight and see how it goes um what is going to happen right now is um, in just a few minutes or seconds, um, you will see an image come up on your screen and we'll ask you to join a breakout room and just click join and we'll automatically take you to 
a room that's connected to this main meeting room but will take you to a separate place where you will join three or four other women together where you can um, discuss things maybe that God has put on your heart or has been speaking to you tonight and then also give you an opportunity to pray for each other if you would like to do that. Um, so when it comes up on your screen, just click join and then we will come back together in about 10 or 15 minutes. And again, when that time is up, it'll come up onto your screen to join back to the main meeting and it will bring you back to the central location at that time. And we'll just come back together just for a minute yeah, to say goodbye. Yeah, just a few more minutes to close up and say goodbye. So, um, yeah, if those rooms are ready, we can go ahead and divide that up. And for those of you that are watching later on the recording, we'll see you next week here at 8 o'clock.